What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Mates, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, the hardest working man in all of the NBA, Tim Legler. Legs, we finally got playoff, or at least sort yeah, of playoff man. basketball, play in basketball last yeah. night. What did you think? It's playoff basketball NCAA style, right? That's what we had last night, which yeah. is kind of cool. It's the one taste of it we get a little bit, for two teams anyway, uh, to go home. Um, look, I thought one game. Very entertaining, a lot of drama in it, obviously late, a lot of storylines. The other one, kind of just a, a one-sided affair that exposed a lot about the Golden State Warriors. So I can't wait to dive into both of these games. There's a lot to talk about uh, on both of them. And I'll tell you what, if there's a blowout in the NBA, I think the most entertaining blowouts happen at SoFi Stadium because that Kings crowd, man, when it's a blowout, yeah. it becomes a party there. Maybe there in the yeah. garden are the two best places when the team's rolling. I almost don't even care about the score. It's just there's so much energy to it. There was energy last night in that arena. Uh, it's there. There's people are maniacal, man. And it look, it was like that when I played. The Kings teams weren't good, and it still was like that, even on against bad teams. I mean, they they get there so early before the game. They surround the court. They love watching guys warm up. They're so yeah. into it. And then when you have the Warriors in town, you, you know, it's like all of that stuff on steroids. And that's what you got last night. And then it's you know, and now if you really actually get off to a good start and play well, They that arena can go places that very few in this league can touch. And I, I completely agree with you. The environment looked amazing. Yeah, it felt cathartic. Watching it, I have to imagine those fans felt some catharsis as well. We're going to talk about that series. We're going to start, though, with the Lakers Pelicans and then move on to Lakers Nuggets. And then right at the end of the show, we'll preview tonight's games very briefly and and ask Legs what he's looking for in those matchups. But first, we are presented, as always, by DraftKings. Stay tuned, because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, the first game of the night last night, the Lakers beat the Pelicans 110-106. I thought they actually controlled the game for most of the game. The Pelicans make a heroic comeback behind Zion and not Brandon Ingram, not C.J. McCollum in the fourth quarter. And it felt like Zion who went for 40 points, was going to have a historic comeback. A historic comeback. But instead, it did not happen because he comes up limp with two minutes to go and the Lakers were able to pull it out. All right, that's the rundown of what happened. Legs, what stood out to you about this one? All right, let's start with um, just overall, like the the performance, I think, by Pelicans. Like Zion went into a mode last night that he should be in far more often than he is. and and you wait for these nights and, and they he'll sprinkle them throughout the season. But when you can see when he plays with that level of intent and energy offensively, because that to me is what it is about Zion. When he has that level of intent and energy, there not, isn't really an answer for Zion Williamson. There really isn't because he, he still finds a way to get around or over size. He plays through size sometimes. And if you don't have size, he, you can't really keep him in front of you with the first step. He always gets to his left hand despite the fact that everybody's trying to prevent that. I just thought it was a, a like an electric performance out of a guy that should give us a lot more of those nights in the regular season than he does. But give him credit, on a night they had to have it, he brought it. And unfortunately for him, the other two guys that you really count on on that team, Brandon Ingram and C.J. McCollum, did not. So you're like, where's it going to come from? Their role players and their bench absolutely give them all the credit in the world for getting them back in that game, getting it to a one possession type situation and with a few minutes to play. It's anybody's game. And at that point, that's when the Lakers made all the plays and the Pelicans made some mistakes that really cost them. And the Lakers, as they've done a lot this year, they play great in those situations and they make the shots they have to D'Angelo Russell, big play, Austin Reeves, a couple of passes that mattered AD finishing some stuff around the rim. D'Angelo Russell made a big defensive play on the other end. So they made the plays, Adam, 
when once you got to a point where it's anybody's game with three minutes to go, the Lakers have been winning a lot of those kinds of games this year, and they did it again last night. They did it, but again, I, with two minutes to go is when Zion went out, and I think it was those last two minutes that you're talking about where they really executed and, and made some big-time plays, but in the lead-up to that, they did not. And I think that the last five, six minutes, so we'll say the first four minutes of that that final stretch, to me mean as much when we extrapolate the Lakers and we'll start to talk about them here going forward. I was unimpressed with those minutes as I was impressed with the final two. And the fact that those final two came with the Pelicans team that made a very big decision to not bring Brandon Ingram back and then goes and says, we're just going to ride Zion. We're going to ride this. I love the Herb Jones, Trey Murphy lineups when you put both of them on the floor. We're going to ride Jose Alvarado. And you do that. And I actually liked that call. I'm curious what you think. But I liked that call by Willie Green. But when Zion comes up limp with two minutes to go, all of a sudden you can't go to that strategy anymore. I almost felt like the Pelicans were doomed because they were riding Zion and this staggered lineup. And once he went out, you had to make the adjustment. And I, it's almost asking too much of the Pelicans to say, okay, with two minutes, now we're going to bring in our original start closers and try to get it done. That's too late. Yeah, and they, and they didn't do it. And C.J. McCollum came back in the game. He had a rough night, but he had a couple baskets late that, that ended up not meaning a whole lot. Um, right. But you went back to him. I think one of the – one, of, and we'll get to the Lakers in a second, but one of the big storylines from this that I'm sh very surprised has not gotten more talk today, and I had to actually kind of check with some people – this morning to find out is there something I'm missing here that I don't want to, you know, get off track here and say something without having all the information, but I didn't apparently get anything that's going to dissuade me from saying this. Why are we not making a little bit of a bigger deal out of Brandon Ingram's um, body language on the bench last night? I, I don't, this is a guy that's trying to get a max deal. He just came back from an injury. He, he's, you know, he, he hasn't been a huge factor for them last night. He didn't play well and he was, I thought forcing the issue with so with too much one on one play, and he was struggling. And so Willie Green sitting there, they're down double digits, second half, and he's going, I don't know what else to do. CJ McCollum doesn't have it going. Zion's the only thing you're, that you're riding. So you switch up and you go to a different lineup. And Murphy and Alvarado and Nance, those guys energize them and just go look at what Brandon Inger was doing during that stretch. He's sitting on the bench. He's not even at the buried at the end of the bench where you can't see him when the camera's on the bench. Like some guys will do that. He didn't even do that. He sat about, I don't know, six seats down, so just past the coaches. And while this run is going on and the whole bench is up and they're celebrating and they're obviously like trying to get back in this game and the emotions in the arena and everything else. And Zion is showing a lot of – he's being, you know, demonstrative and he doesn't really do that a whole lot. Like this thing is like, wow, we've turned the game around. And Brandon Ingram's sitting there. He's sitting down with his head down. And they keep showing him on camera, and I'm going, what in the world? Like, the look couldn't be worse. Could not be yeah. worse. Like, I am so wrapped up in what's going on with me right now. I am not going to participate in being a good teammate right now in, in what's going on on this bench and do whatever I can to help on a night when I wasn't playing well. He was very pouty, and he was obviously he was upset about not playing, and Willie Green never went back to him, and I don't blame him. But I'm just yeah. – I was shocked, honestly shocked, that any player could not have the wherewithal to understand in that moment whatever you're thinking and going through. The bottom line is this. You better fake your way through it, man. You could take yeah. that stuff home with you when you leave the arena and you can say whatever you want and vent to your family and you can be ticked off and you can act – you can leave without talking to me, whatever you want to do. But in the moment, you better figure out how to way to support your teammates. And yeah. I just felt like he kind of checked out and it was, it was, it was tough. And then Zion goes out because maybe that's a situation where, Hey, he wasn't great, but we took him out for a stretch, but you know what? I, I still, I'm going to go back to him right now. Cause it still is Brandon Ingram. The guy can get buckets and we need offense. And he didn't, he didn't go there because of, of everything that had happened. And I just thought it was a really kind of telling moment for Brandon Ingram. And he, he did not handle that well at all. Fortunately for them, they have another game to play to get into the postseason, and maybe, you know, he'll show up and play a lot better if there's no carryover from this. But, Adam, I, I, to your point, I agree. They went with the lineup that gave them a chance. Alvarado was way better offensively than, than I thought yeah. he could be in that moment. Um, you know, we know he's going to guard guys and all that kind of stuff disrupt, and he can make some plays with his passing. He, he was, like, very aggressive looking for his shot and set guys up. They get back in the game with that unit. You got a chance to win it. But at the end of the day, when Zion went out, you're right. There was no real answer now on those last few possessions. What are we going to do right here to get a bucket? 
because the Lakers had pretty good responses at that time. I mean, even speaking of Brandon Ingram, I, I've heard from my people in New Orleans that it, it extended into the post game that Brandon Ingram stormed out of the building pretty upset. And Willie Green is smart enough to know, you know, he was he was a player. He's he I, his strength is how he connects to his team and his and his players. He knew that not bringing him back in was going to cause a conflict. But to your point, Brandon Ingram has to be better in those moments because it's a do or die game. There's no time for you to be focused on that thing, even though I'm sure it's tough for him. But Legs, we've spent all year doing the show. We love the NBA. We're so passionate about basketball. But we hate, you know, when games don't feel like they mean something, regular season, when, when players treat them yeah. like that. The meaning of the regular season is subtle. Any one game doesn't feel like it means a lot. But you miss too many games. And then the question is, does this team know who it is? And what all year I've been saying about the New Orleans Pelicans is they were a two-faced team. Because when they're great, they look unbelievable. But I don't know if they know who they are. And this is why their clutch record hasn't been great this year. They haven't won a lot of close games. Do you know who you are when you have to go into the foxhole? And last night, going away from CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram, some of that was riding the hot hand, a lineup that was working, maybe matchup this or that. But some of it to me is the point that you're just making here. Why was Brandon Ingram throwing a fit? That's a team that has not figured out who they are in the foxhole and they found themselves in the foxhole for the very first time. And it was revealed that there was this uncertainty. That's, that's my read on it. And yeah, look, some of this is injuries. Zion and, and, and Ingram have missed a lot of time. I don't want to blame and say, Hey, sometimes they're real injuries, but they might've missed more, you know, too much time with their injuries to really know who they are. I completely agree with all of that. And I think that the bottom line is this, you know, if you're Brandon Ingram, like, like whether you have the personality type or not, and he's kind of one of those sort of laid back dudes, right? He's always got kind of that sleepy look on his face, but he's very ultra talented. You're one of the leaders, whether you like it or not. You're one of the leaders yeah. of the team. And th this is an opportunity. Now, look, truth of the matter is, maybe some of it that plays into this is it's not the end of the world to lose the game. Maybe that's right. part of it. It's yeah. not. Think about it now. You go ahead and hold home court. Now, look, the Zion situation, that, that throws a wrinkle into this. That's totally different. I don't know what his status is going to be, but if you came out of that game, I can't imagine you being ready to play the next game because this right. is a muscular thing, right? And I still haven't heard, by the way, is it thigh? Is it is it his quad? Is hammy? Is groin? No one knows. It was the weirdest thing for, for that to lead to him leaving the game. Um, but anyway, we'll get more, more information on that. So that could be all bets off in terms of their ability to win the next game. But, you you know, you didn't know it while this was all going on. Brandon Ingram sitting there. You, you have another game you think you're going to play, and you're probably going to beat the Warriors or Kings. That's the way you look at it. And then you get to actually play Oklahoma City, not Denver. So in a lot of ways, the, the penalty for losing the game wasn't significant enough maybe to elicit a different reaction out of Brandon Ingram. But I just think no matter what, you cannot show yourself like that publicly for everybody to see, that's for total consumption for everyone to watch. You, you sitting there refusing to stand up like every other player of the team that's on the bench and standing up during that rally. You can't do it. And then I like, sort of disengage during the huddles, kind of standing there, hands on hips, looking into the huddle, disinterested. You got to be kidding me. Willie Green deserved better. Man, Zion deserved better. Like those guys deserve better. All of those guys. So I, I'm being harsh on, on Brandon Ingram, but I'm sorry. It's a huge, huge pet peeve for me. It, yeah. and, and I get how ticked off you are. I totally get that, man. You better keep that under or behind the curtain until you get out of the building. Now you yeah, do whatever it, you want to do, man. You say whatever you want to your close circle. Do whatever the hell you want to do. You do it. But you better keep that curtain pulled because you, that exposed something about you that doesn't speak to leadership or team oriented player. And that's a bad, that's a bad thing when you're going into the summer. So that to me was a bigger takeaway than what the game ended up being because the Pelicans lived to see another day. It's not like their season ended last night. They lived to right. see another day wow. and the Lakers move on to play Denver. So it's not like the, the, the finality. So for me, the bigger story is obviously Zion what's wrong with him. And then, the Brandon Ingham component, and how does Willie Green handle that in this next game? We'll have the update. Obviously, tomorrow's show, we'll talk about that. It hasn't come out about with Zion. Just to wrap up on the Pelican side, the silver lining to me, Alvarado played great. Herb Jones played great. Trey Murphy played great. You got good performances from a lot of guys. You got terrible performances from CJ and Ingram, and that sunk you. 
But then you look at Zion, 40 points. This is the promise uh, of Zion's talent. He took 27 shots. He even took a three legs. Like we talk about him needing to take jumpers. He missed it, but his willingness to sort of do the hard stuff and be aggressive is very impressive. And I'm always reminded of back in 2017 or 2018, Kevin Durant's with the Warriors and he's in Denver. And I'm watching Jokic have these all-time performance. Early in his career, he's having these great performances. And I asked KD, do you think he can be one of the greats? And he said the key for him is going to be a lot of guys have the talent to do this every other game or what have you. Yeah. But great players, they do it every single night. And I think for Zion, Absolutely. it feels like you've come over the hump when you score 40, 11, and 5 in a playoff game. It feels like you're over the hump. But that's actually not the hump. The hump is now that's your standard. Now you got to go out and do that every single night, and we'll see if he can do that. Quickly, though, we got to keep it moving here. We don't have a ton of time. Let's go to the Lakers side. D'Angelo Russell, uh, 5 of 11 from 3. Austin Reeves, 2 of 5 from 3. They go for 21 and 16 points, respectively. That's their key. And as we move it now to the Nuggets Lakers series, they win, so their reward is the reigning NBA champs. That was a sweep last year. The games were competitive, but Denver won in the clutch. At every single game, they out-executed in the clutch, both offensively and defensively. So is it different this year? And if so, what is different about this matchup, Legs? It doesn't feel different to me. I don't know what would be different. The only the only thing that might be more of an X factor in the series is D'Angelo Russell, I think, is playing at a higher level than he was last year. And he is no a guy that can, you know, he can give you so he can throw some 20 point games at you. And even going into last night, I looked at like he and Austin Reeves in the last two games against New Orleans had gone 17 for 34 from the three. Those two guys against New Orleans in those two games. And it's so critical to the Lakers. They don't take a lot of threes. They're a low-volume three-point shooting team. They're a little bit more selective. They play to their strengths most of the time, which is in the interior. LeBron putting pressure on you. Anthony Davis' size around the rim. That's that's their best way to attack you, right? But you need some three-point shooting, and it's been pretty consistent with Reeves and Russell during their good stretches and here at the end of the year, and they did it again last night, 7 for 16. That's what it's going to take. You don't need to go off. Russell, Russell was 5 for 11, though, and he has, I feel like, more capability of doing that this year than last year. I expect it more this year, and I think that could be an element injected into this series that Denver didn't necessarily have to deal with as much because I think he's more confident. He's just playing better. It, he, it looks more consistent coming off his fingertips. I expect it to go in at a higher rate. So that, I think, is absolutely an element for the Lakers – that can help narrow the gap. Look, I don't think anybody's going to pick them to win the series. And, you know, some people I heard today saying, oh, shocked if this goes more than five. I wouldn't be shocked if right. this is a 4-2 series. Shocked if it went seven. Shocked if the Lakers won. Absolutely. I'm not shocked if the Lakers, they, they're playing well right now, and they still have two great players on their team. I'm not going to be shocked if the Lakers win two games in this series. More likely it's a five-game series. But they're not going to beat Denver. But I do think because of the D'Angelo Russell factor, it's a little bit different, I think, offensively for the Lakers. I trust them a little bit more to get quality three-point shooters or timely three-point shooting when they have to have it. I felt didn't feel that way about them last year at all. So I think D'Angelo Russell is the key here. And what's interesting is last year, the Lakers series might have been Bruce Brown's best series. He was really good for Denver. And in particular, yeah. he was good against D'Angelo Russell both ends. He did a great job. I think you have to get physical. You have to be into his space. D'Angelo Russell's a guy that likes things pretty. He likes the game pretty. If he can get to his threes, he can get to his comfortable, the, the plays he likes to make. If you can allow him that, then he can find a rhythm as he did last night and make his shots. I think you have to pester him. You have to get physical with him. But equally as important, he is a major liability on the other end. And he has made himself better this year. He's put more effort into it. But last year, Bruce Brown in transition and in the half court seemed to take great pride in attacking him specifically. And it's why I think it was his best series last year was against uh, D'Angelo Russell in particular. This year, I don't think that his defensive improvements to me have been mostly effort-based. I don't think they're, he's going to be a meaningfully different defender in the playoffs against Denver. But I don't know if Denver has enough players to attack him and exploit him defensively to play him off the court like last year. Yeah. You have Jamal Murray. You have your starting lineup. But your bench is going to be more Christian Brown, Reggie Jackson. Is Reggie Jackson going to be able to exploit D'Angelo Russell's poor defense? I don't know that he will to the degree that, that Bruce Brown did. So that's one difference. And it has a trickle effect because it means you can play D'Angelo Russell more minutes and you can play him in more versatile lineups. 
All fair, man. I love that point about D'Lo on the other end of the floor. Um, I think another factor in this, look, if I'm Anthony Davis, and I saw the numbers this morning of what Jokic does to him when, when directly guarded by Anthony Davis, uh, he's got, I think, a 64% effective field goal percentage uh, directly against him and a 4-1 to one assist to turnover ratio. So, so he's not being affected as a playmaker or really as a scorer or efficient shooter, any of that stuff. Fine. Nobody can do it to Jokic. I get it. He's that good. There's no answer for him. You're not going to affect him in that way. I understand that. You can have game plan strategy against him, and I'm curious to see what the Lakers decide to do. Do you want to dare him to try to be a 35, 40-point scorer a lot of nights because of what you're trying to do to other guys and see if he's willing to do that? And we know Jokic can do it for a game or two, but will he want to do it for a whole series? Maybe that's one strategy they employ. Maybe not. Maybe it's the opposite. And they just dare some of these other guys, including when their bench is on the floor, Peyton Watson and Christian Brown or Reggie Jackson. Like, are you guys going to be ready to step up for the moment the way that, that Bruce Brown did last year? So th- I don't know how that's going to go. Here's the one thing I will say about Anthony Davis. I give him a lot of respect this year. He played. He didn't miss games with minor injuries that lingered for two weeks. He, he played hard. He played well. He's a force on both ends. There's no reason that he can't have – high level offensive success on the other end of the floor right against Jokic against whoever's guarding him he can put up numbers now he won't have as good offensive rebounding numbers that he normally does that's a big factor for the mm. Lakers because Jokic cleans up all that he can cleans up all the defensive class there's just not as many opportunities and if you're running in there not getting the ball because Jokic is getting it you're you now Anthony Davis is your last guy back in transition that's a problem because Denver's really good when they selectively run in the open floor. So the offensive rebounding probably won't be as good, but there's no reason Anthony Davis can't average 25 points a game in this series. And that would be my mentality. Like, look, this dude is a load on the other end. There's not much I can do. I'm going to rely on teammates to help me. We know he's going to have great numbers every night. But you know what? I can go at him. And that would be my approach if I was Anthony Davis, man. I'm going to try to get 30 in every single one of these games. Like, that's my mentality because I think he can have great success offensively against Jokic and I have more faith in Anthony Davis right now than I did last year because of the regular season he just had he he, the most games he's ever played he was there every night I wasn't doubting Anthony Davis I wasn't talking about him all the time like I normally do because he didn't play or he didn't show up he he didn't really do a lot of that this year man he had a great year and as a result now give your team a chance go at Jokic go at their front line You, you are a very difficult guy to guard yourself and let's see what his mentality is. Because if it's not that, Lakers have absolutely no shot to make this competitive. There's no question about it. The one thing I'd push back on, and it actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna share both sides on this. Another difference to me, and it's it, along the lines you're talking about. They met in the Western Conference Finals last year, and the Lakers had a tough time getting there. Right? They had to battle to get to the Western Conference Finals. They're an older team, especially we talk about LeBron, and they, you know, I think there was a little bit of a fatigue factor. Jokic is also a player when he goes up against Anthony Davis and he goes up against a lot of centers that have athleticism on their side. He tries to use endurance on his side. So he tries to sprint. He gets physical. He tries to turn this into an endurance battle and he can win that against Anthony Davis. But this is the first round of the playoffs. The team should come in much more rested. There's more time between games. So I think that the edge of endurance that Denver and Jokic in particular won against Anthony Davis last year at least shrinks a little bit. Now, I think the margin between the two of them last year was pretty massive. But nonetheless, every margin you can sort of shrink, you know, helps you. And I think that's one that might shrink in the series. I think that's fair take. I have heard something, though, that's going around and it kind of leads lends to your, itself to your point you just made. Where to say, oh, it's good to get them early. Get the Nuggets early. It's a better chance. And, and I, I guess the point being... Well, because they're not quite in their playoff rhythm. Like, they don't have as many games under their belt in the playoffs. I don't think that that applies to the Nuggets. They've got the same guys, man. It's the same system, yeah. same players. They're, that is a zero factor for me that they're going to they're gonna have to ramp it up as, the, as the, each round goes on. No, they're going to be really good offensively immediately. I think, actually, the one thing that you might catch a break on if you get them two rounds from now, the way they did a year ago, maybe – Somebody has rolled their ankle in the meantime because they have perfect health right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're coming in and they are absolutely ready to roll. If you have a couple rounds under your belt, you don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody really loses their confidence off the bench. It's not making shots. Maybe somebody, like I said, is dealing with some injury that they didn't have when the playoffs started. I think it might give you a little bit of a better chance then. So I don't know about this mentality of get them early. 
almost like they're not going to be ready for you early in the playoffs. It's silly, man. It's the Denver Nuggets. Come on. They're ready for everything. I, the last point I have on this one is, and look, Denver's the team I cover. I watch it more than any other team. I know their rhythms more than any other team. These teams have played a lot in the last handful of years as mostly the same version of themselves. There's been little parts here or there that have, that have changed. Jokic gets reads on players. And Anthony Davis, is late as recently as 2020 in the bubble, I thought had Jokic's number. Jokic, I think, has figured him out. He's dominated the last 15 times they've matched up with each other. The Nuggets have dominated the last, I don't know, 11, 12 games they played. And I just think that this is another, is there enough different from the Lakers this year to throw at Jokic that he has to solve the puzzle? Or is this a puzzle he's already solved, already knows what to do, and he'll have a massive advantage in it? I kind of t tend to go towards the latter, but I think that'll be one of the uh, deciding factors in the series. Can you confuse Jokic, since he's the fulcrum of the offense, can you confuse him at all in a way that forces him to have to learn a new adjustment? If so, you might be able to buy a game. But if not, I, I, I'll take Denver. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I don't, listen, I don't, I don't expect anything new to be thrown at Jokic to make him even incrementally less efficient. And by yeah. the way, in the last eight games that they won against Lakers, his, his numbers, and I had some fun with this. I was going to get up this morning, had some fun with it because they put this graphic up with a picture of Jokic and the giant number was 26.6 because that's the points per game in the last eight. Yeah. And then tiny little numbers in parentheses underneath of it, 13 rebounds, 11 assists. And I made him. <laughs> and I made him when it came to me. I said, "No, no, no, no! Put that graphic back up. Let's talk about these little numbers in the parentheses as if they're not as significant as the twenty six points because they absolutely are. So his numbers are incredible against them. He's his IQ with his strength, his touch, his feel for the game. It's unparalleled in the game right now. I don't expect that to happen. It's going to take for them to win this series. It's I don't, put put it this way: if the Lakers were to even really make this, I don't think they can win it. Even if they make this a really long, tough, grinded out series, a lot of meaningful fourth quarter possession, even if they're able to do that, I don't think it's going to be, we're not going to be talking every day about, oh, wow, Jokic. They really did a good job on Jokic. I don't. I think it's going to be because they're going to have guys that really play great offensively. That's what I yeah. think it's going to be. Like D'Angelo Russell plays great in this series. Austin, Austin Reeves plays great in this series. Like AD and whoever it may be. That's why I think they're going to – if if that happens, that would be the reason. Not because they had some thing they threw at Jokic that we've not quite seen before. I just don't think that exists in the NBA. There's nothing that he can right. see. All right? There's nothing. Until Victor Weminyama is on a team good enough to play against yeah. Jokic. Okay? Because now you might have something. Like, wait a second, Al. This is different. He hasn't seen this. Right? That's that's down the road, but right now with what's in the league, what he's going to see, certainly with this team, I don't expect there to be much different at all. I think this is going to be very precision-like on the part of the Denver Nuggets. There will be some close games, I believe, in the first four. There will be a couple of those that are very close games, and you just trust Denver to get a quality possession more than any other team in the league when the game is tight. I, I agree. I think the Nuggets have a strong edge in this. I don't think it's impossible that the Lakers win the series, but I think it's a strong edge. And I think the reigning champs probably deserve that. The records reflect that. And Jokic, the level he's played over the last four years, probably deserves that as well. But you got LeBron, you got AD, you've got a chance. All right, let's go to a quick break here. On the other side, we're only going to have about seven minutes to break down the other game that happened last night, which was the Kings getting a big time and cathartic win over their rival, the uh, Golden State Warriors. We'll talk about that on the other side. But first, the 82-game preseason is in the books, and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays. Those are fun to do. Live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Um, also, this weekend, or on Friday, we're going to be dropping our own betting preview, Legs and I, of the East and the West playoffs, so you'll be looking out for that. We'll, of course, be using DraftKings to make those picks. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code ALLNBA. New customers bet 5 bucks and get 200 in bonus bets instantly, whether you win or lose. That's code ALLNBA, A-L-L-NBA, only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball 
for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Back here on the All NBA Show, throw us a like if you're watching live, leave us a comment, and subscribe if you're watching it a little bit later. Legs, you get to take a bit of a victory lap here because the star of our second game was not Steph Curry, it was not De'Aaron Fox, it was not Sabonis. It was Keegan Murray, 32 points, 8 of 13 from 3. He was the player of the game in that series, and the Kings get a an impressive win, 118-94 over the Warriors. Wait, you mean Keegan Murray? <laughs> like, it, it, I talk about cool. an adrenaline rush. An adrenaline yeah. rush if you're Keegan Murray. My goodness, man. I never got the Tim Legler treatment like that when I was playing in Washington. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, the guy was sensational. And it, look, he came out. He came out right out of the gate. First six minutes, he was the best player on the court. He set the tone for his entire night. So that's a great story, obviously, 32 points. And we've been talking about Keegan Murray since the beginning of the year, yep. right? And, and taking sure. that step. And, man, was he was he fantastic in this game. But there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, you name it, any which way you want to, the Kings dominated them. They're faster. They're far more uh, – far more um, – and greater ability to pressure you defensively, and it really bothered Golden State's ball handlers. Picking them up as far out on the court as they did, long arms, quick guys, lateral movement, very difficult time getting separation in space. Curry had to do far too much off the dribble. They got all over the offensive glass, 15 offensive rebounds. So even when you played decent defense, they got a second opportunity to beat you. Every time they they needed a, an, an important three after the Warriors had cut into that lead, they got an important three from the corner of the wing. Guys knocking down open shots. They got, you know, everything you could want in the second half of that game, particularly last 18 minutes of the game, was a complete domination of the Golden State Warriors and exposed them so badly for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, obviously, Clay, arguably the worst game of his career. I mean, he's never played 900 yeah. something games, had a game where he played more than 12 minutes and didn't score. Man. That you saw it last night. That's a one-off. What you watched out of Clay Thompson. So literally, could he could argue it's the worst game of his career? Um, you know, some of those other younger guys. You know, they they helped. They helped, and Kaminga helped get get them back in the game in the second quarter. But the ceiling is still a certain level for those guys. Curry, like I said, hounded, having to do so much with a live dribble rather than off the ball. And the reason is because they don't have as many threats when Clay's playing like that, where you have to honor that off the ball stuff. You can still lock in on, on, on Steph. So they gave him the ball. So you know what? Actually, just go take the ball. Now he's out there running 35-foot ball screens, guys jumping out, blitzing him. I felt sorry for Steph Curry in this game because he Same. just looked worn down, man. He looked worn down. And it, it, he was out there offensively pretty much by himself in the second half. And it was just a, a do dominant performance out of the Kings. They wanted this team. This was a, a cathartic is a good word. You used it earlier. That's what this was for them. Exercise the demons of the Golden State Warriors and get this win and and have an opportunity. Now, you still got to win a game to get in the playoffs, but at least it wasn't the Warriors that sent them home packing this year. You can't say enough about how thoroughly dominant the Kings were in the last 18 minutes of this game. And they go to a seven-man rotation. One of the things about losing Monk and Herder is you just don't – we talked about this earlier. They faltered down the stretch because they didn't have enough guys. You can't do a seven-man rotation – to close the season. And so they're going to Duarte and Vesenkov and different guys that, you know, Jones, the guys that really cost them. In this game, you just go to Trey Lyles and Davion Mitchell off the bench. You play your starters 35 plus minutes, and they actually looked really good doing it. It gives you hope for their upcoming matchup with the Pelicans. Really quickly on the other side, we don't, we just have to give a quick Warriors eulogy here because it felt watching the game last night like the end of an era. It's, it probably ended after that title. But you want to see it through. Last night, to me, felt like a game where there could be no doubt about what the core of that Warriors team is and, and where, they're, where they're at. Clay, you mentioned, um, but it, it wasn't even just him. I thought all across the board, Pajemski, who's looked good throughout the year, clearly, a, defensively, he has so far to go that to think of him as he played a role in the regular season, but could he be a guy that played a role for this team in the playoffs? Clearly the answer was no. And then even the lack of size, they were forced to play Kevon Looney nine minutes, and he actually did an okay job, but he fouled every minute he was on the floor. So for me, this feels like that's a team that is at the very end. And it was a great run. Ten years, basically, where they were a relevant, important team. One of the most relevant and important teams we've seen in the history of the league. But last night felt like the last page, the last sentence. 
Uh, yes, I kind of agree. I kind of felt that way last year, to be honest with you. Um, when they went out the way they did against the Lakers and they just looked completely swallowed up by that team defensively and clay in particular. And it kind of felt that way, but then you come back this year and, and look, they're a play in worthy type team. That's what they're going to be next year. I believe, by the way, I don't think they're disappearing. They're not going to be 34 games next year. They could run it back with this team and they're not going to do that. But that's obviously they, they got to look at this whole thing and figure out how can we improve? Because the bottom line is, you know, you got Draymond locked up for a lot of money. You know, you'd have to consider, are you going to really going to consider moving Draymond Green? Are you going to get back an asset that's going to help you win with Steph Curry that, who still looks like a guy that could do you know, special things on the court? I don't know that you get that back for him. Klay Thompson clearly is going to have to take a massive pay cut if they re-sign him. There's, but, hey, maybe Klay Thompson says, you know what? Maybe I'm a plug-and-play guy going to a number of four or five contending teams, and I'd be a perfect fit off of some of the talent that those teams have. I don't know where Klay Thompson's mind is. I think he wants to spend his whole career in Gold State – finish his career next to Steph Curry. That's the case. Massive pay cut and different role. I still think Klay Thompson has enough nights where he's pretty good that he can come off your bench and he could be a guy that then he finishes out his career that way and still be effective a lot of nights. It's just not consistent. The, the, the biggest question on this team is, look, you got Kaminga, you got Pajemski, you got Trace Jackson Davis. Those are three young guys that that you know you really like on that team. But let's be very honest. As much as I like Kaminga, and I did see a significant step forward, what ultimately really is Kaminga's ceiling? Is he really going to be a guy that you think is going to elevate himself to an all-star, second second seat co-star type player next to Steph and like challenge these loaded teams in the Western Conference? I don't think so because I don't think his handle's ever going to be good enough to do that. He's good. Look, mm-hmm. he might average 16, 17, 18 points a game. I don't think Kaminga's going to be a good enough three-point shooter or ball handler to elevate it to that level where now he's a guy that can go get you 25, 30 most nights and, and, and supplement Curry. So there's a ceiling there for him. And then Pajemski and, and Trace Jackson Davis are going to be really nice role players their entire careers. That's what they're going to be. Let's just be honest about all of this. They're good players. They can be on winning teams. There's no doubt. I'm just talking about ceiling next to Steph. If Clay's not that, if Wiggins isn't that, because clearly he's not the same player that he was when he won a championship. And I don't know if he's going to be able to get there again. So that's the question. How do we find that guy? What are we going to do with our team currently to get that back? A younger player that is a 20-point scorer that can get his own offense. That is what they need because the other guys on this team are too inconsistent. They'll win their share of games. They'll be over 500. They'll be a play-in type team. And this was how it will go for another year or two probably they could do that before it really kind of falls off, the wheels fall off the wagon. But that's not what they want to do with Curry. They want to find a way to contend. And the only way to do that is go find a kind of guy that I just described. Give me real quick. We didn't have time to do the previews, but real quick, Kings, Pelicans, Zion, questionable. I'm worried he's not going to play in that one. I think the Kings I, roll if Zion doesn't play. I think the Kings win the game if you don't play. I mean, just look at if, if he's off the floor, McCollum, McCollum, you know, really struggled the other night. And Brandon Ingram, we just talked about, he's not in a good place. So you got Sabonis playing at a high level, Fox at a high level, Keegan Murray, like what he just did, and then these other role players playing well. If Zion does not play in that game, I think the Kings win the game. And I'd be shocked if he does play because how could something that you come back and play two days later, how could that be if you walked off the court in that moment? Whatever he felt was scaring him enough to realize that if I jump one more time, if I cut one more time, this could be a serious injury. That's some sort of muscular thing. I'd be shocked if he plays, and that's why I think the Kings are probably going to win the game. If he plays, and, and if he plays, I'm assuming it's because he feels some whatever that was. It's you know he he, he uh, I guess overreacted or whatever it may be. That's the only way I could see him playing. If he plays, I, the, the Pelicans have a good chance to win that game. If he doesn't, the Kings are going to win. 76ers Heat tonight. Yeah. Look, yeah, I, I like the Sixers. You know that. I like the Sixers in this game. I like the Sixers to make a run in the Eastern Conference. And the key is this game, though, clearly. Yeah. Because if you don't win this game, you go right immediately in. If you win the next game against the winner of the Bulls-Hawks, you get the Celtics right off the bat. And they're not surviving that. I don't think anybody is in the Eastern Conference. Philly's the closest. But, you you know, I don't think you, they can beat them. And I, you don't want to get them first. So, the key is you got to win this game if you're Philadelphia, man. You have it at home. You have to win this game against a Heat team that's been very inconsistent. Get the win. Go on. Advance. Go take on the Knicks. I think they have a great chance of winning that series as well. 
I'm, I'm worried about Embiid's health. We're going to find out yeah. tonight. I think it's such an interesting game because I just want to see not even what he scores, what he does, how healthy does he look? Because if they are going to do what you talk about, not only win tonight, but make a run, he has to be 100%, and I'm a little worried he's not based on then, some of the latest reporting. Real quick, we didn't talk about the other game. Bulls, Hawks, here's how I feel about that. <laughs> Hawks, what do you got? Hawks, Hawks. Hawks. All right, there it is. It came up Hawks. That's, that's about all I got for that game. There you go. All right, Legs, good stuff. Tomorrow should be another great show as we're going to get into more of these playoff previews on the other side. Don't forget, subscribe. We're doing this every day this week. We're doing it four days every week for the playoffs. Hit that like button. We'll see you on the other side. Like the mayor.